wonderful to have you all back for another episode, which happens to be our 237th of ThinkTecherWise Human Humane Architecture. And you were back with our transcontinental uh, triumvirate triangle from three different parts of the world with our mid-century modern master, Ronald Lindgren, back in his Long Beach, California with close to record high temperatures of 89 degrees in late March. Hi, Ron. Good to have Hello you. Hello, everyone. And we have Yudha Soto Brown, this time not in your Bishop Museum, because on special request of Jay Fidel and others, back home in your childhood home, Osipov designed and with our favorite dogs in the back. Hi, De Soto. Hello, everyone. <laughs> If we can get the first slide up, um, which is not quite as funny, unfortunately, um, because on the right, we see what's happening with close to me, because me, your co-host Martin Despang, when you wish so close to Munich, it's only about a thousand, a little bit more miles away to what you see on the right, which is what's going on in the Ukraine where cities as uh, mostly uh, in the focus Mariupol, which you see at the bottom there, is being leveled to the ground and buildings going down and with them, people's lives. So um, while on the left side, you see us back in Honolulu, where you see buildings popping up and I think this is, you know, this is volume two and the volume one, we couldn't uh, assess differently than saying they're kind of popping up almost as poisonous mushrooms. And what was your way to, to, uh, to, to call that, Ron? Uh, toadstools in the rain. <laughs> there you go. And the, the two projects of this, um, I, we were about to say, um, could we please bring uh, what this show title of Midtown Flunk is alluding to uh, Patrick Hernandez's alias Bruno Mars and Mark Ronson's Downtown Funk, but unfortunately there is this copyright thing. So we have to reach out to him and uh, hopefully he can give us permissions because he might be sympathetic because he grew up um, being without a house um, uh, and his father in the backyard of uh, my employer in, in Manoa. And so um, two, uh, the two first projects here that are going up uh, recently um, are different than the ones we were reporting on in the previous shows, which in some way or the other tried to allude to nature as an inspiration as the lily, the flower of the lily as for the new rental apartments in Waikiki and the sugar cane as for the most recent uh, Howard Hughes Tower. These towers here don't even try, or at least not the previous one that we basically finished uh, looking at in the last show. And we forgot to mention his name, but we feature it down there on slide four at the bottom left. It's, they, it's, they name it the Azure. And Zor, Azure is blue, it's the color blue. And what do they mean with this? Uh, it might be as shallow as, as the matching the, the sky's color. But the sky is a biochromatic phenomenon uh, that works uh, without fossil fuel, but these blue tinted windows are the opposite. They are basically as fossil as you can get it. And we just started then uh, to feature the project that we see at the top left, which is once again, borrowing more from nature, but in a more abstract way, as it's been called the park. And now we want to further look into this project. So that brings up uh, slide number two. And you, Ron, you've done quite some investigation in, uh, in the project uh, based upon these slides. So please take over. I was, I was just really interested in uh, the very small studio unit plans that were shown at the bottom of the slide, because it's, it's really indicative of the housing crisis. Even if you had $280,000 in Honolulu, that would be what it would take to buy one of the units, studio units at the park, which is only 330 square feet interior, uh, and some of them have 110 square foot lanai. But 
that's what you that's what you live with. That's what your 30 year mortgage is based on. And that particular plan size is much smaller than even any typical uh, uh, Waikiki hotel room. Uh, the, the photos above, however, are showing some fine, uh, some fine units, floor ceiling glass at the end uh, of the towers that these units appear in. Uh, but Martin, as you uh, pointed out, they are going to be baking in east and or west sun. That's right. And maybe in, in its defense, again, I'm, as we know, Martin lives on when he's back in Waikiki Grand on 230 square feet. But that was the standard of somewhere in the 60s, right? And the big difference is Martin, and this is your point, Ron, my, um, uh, Ernest Hara, John Hara's father, who is the architect of my building, uh, orientated it right, facing straight south. So Myla and I is keeping me cool, especially in the summer where it's the hottest. And in the winter time, because I'm trying to live what I teach and vice versa, and I preach and vice versa, um, in the winter time, the sun, you know, creeps in and minimizes my livable floor plan because I insist to live uh, by a climatic way, but it works rather well and I'm able to stay rather cool. In this case here, not because the long facades where most of the units are uh, facing are west and east. And this is where the sun rises and sets. This is where it's low and where it's hot. And even though you have a nice slab, but it doesn't help you because it's like the lid of your of your cap that you wear. If you're looking this into the sunset on Waikiki Beach, that lid is not doing anything but maybe looking cool. And we will get to that soon, what, <laughs> what that is and what that might uh, make, make people do. So yeah, that's, that's the point. And then um, the next slide, Ron, that got you going as well. And you, you're almost about to read what the developer here proposes, right? Yeah, our, our viewers have certainly heard, heard how much we praise the availability of Lanai's uh, in high-rise uh, housing units, as we've been talking about. Here, the developer in this advertising photograph of a corner unit, which has a balcony wrapping around two sides at the corner, we could hardly say it better than he did. The park on Ka Amoku. Expand your living area with a spacious private lanai. Enjoy panoramic views and the gentle breeze of the trade winds. With enough room to dine, entertain, or relax, this outdoors escape will quickly become your favorite part of being at home. We probably couldn't have, have sold an eyes better than the developer did. But uh, oddly enough, the developer didn't have the courage of his convictions and doesn't show any hint of habitability on that balcony. Uh, no plants, no humans, no furniture. Uh, I think uh, DeSoto has it right that they're, they're talking about uh, uh, the view that you get from that unit, which is a grand one, as you can tell. And having some something between you and that view on the balcony is something they perhaps didn't want to uh, to mention. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And we also, in our previous pre-show discussion, we're talking about how they've selected images to emphasize the view, whereas in fact, from other sides of these two buildings, because there are two buildings, there will be clo in close proximity other high rises. So only a selection of the condos in these units, in these, in these two buildings, will get this expansive view without other buildings right close by to them. So obviously for advertising purposes, that's what they want to emphasize. And when I look at that empty balcony, I suddenly realize that, you know, there's, there, there are reasons for balconies we haven't really talked about. To have some sort of, of a barrier at the floor line when you're in a unit that has floor to ceiling glass, helps people like me who are afraid of heights. I would have a hard time in that all glass corner unit if there wasn't that mediating uh, existence of the lanai outside to separate me from the dizzying drop from the 28th floor. Yeah, and when, whenever, let's 
put this into perspective of thermal comfort, whenever I'm getting frustrated with the emerging generation about the computer uh, being ignorant of uh, being able to simulate, I said, I, I should write a grant uh, uh, with NASA and then providing us spacesuits. And in the spacesuits, there would be um, a, a heat machine that would create the temperature that you would create when you design. So when, you know, it would, it would rise up to like 45 degree or 50 in your spacesuit, and you as a designer would frantically do something that helps you to stay cool to get the temperature down in your in your spacesuit, right? I don't know if that grant will ever happen. And it's kind of, you know, again, out of frustration with the, the autistic medium of the digital here. Because if you really are serious about it, this is basically this view, this can only be the Malka unit that is that way facing where the elevation we're looking at primarily is facing north. That's the only uh, um, orientation where the glass, you know, could principally work because the sun is not hitting that at most times of the year. But then logically the other there that you're kind of looking through is then east. And the morning sun is low and it is pretty hot. And they seem to be almost aware of it because there's a curtain shown but a curtain, sorry, behind glass um, is maybe helping the glare, keep the glare away. But uh, the rays, uh, the sun rays have already been converted into heat. So nice try, but really not. So, uh, and, you know, again, this is, as you both point out perfectly, is, 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 is pitched in a way to sell the view. And next slide. In reality, as you guys pointed out, even if you're in the in the tower, in the second tower that's uh, closer to Malka, your first tower would already block you that view, right? So that's rather ironic. And another thing is really ironic is because if you would say, and that's more likely than ever these days, as we know, maybe these fossil fuel oil, you know, ships won't come anymore and they're and their oil can't be converted into electricity that you then use to run your AC in this building. If that would happen, you basically would be very jealous because you would see something across the street, which we show here on the left. And what is that? That's the HMSA building. And as you pointed out, at the time it was designed, the intention was to block as much direct sun as possible from hitting any of the glass. So the intention was to build these exterior sort of extruding concrete sections that would serve as a breeze soleil and protect the entire facade. Therefore, very little direct sun manages to get into the interior of the HMSA building, which is good in terms of keeping down the amount of heat that's also generated inside. And the more heat that's generated inside, the more you have to run air conditioning, the more fuel you're using, the more money you're spending, and the more uh, dependent you on are, are on the existence of fossil fuels being delivered to us in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, absolutely. And for the records, this is a building designed by Chris Smith, who is unfortunately, we did some research and talked to Don Hibbert, and this is by Chris Smith, who is unfortunately not with us on the island anymore, but retired in San Diego. But um, there is no, you know, uh, no uh, reason not to have him. So we should get him on a show and talk to him about it and um, his other projects. And as you said, uh, you know, the sort of the... The form determining factor, that's something when I went to school in the early 90s, which was the most lost time of, you know, postmodernism in its worst um, uh, outcome versus how you, Ron, have practiced it in its best, had just tanked and we were just totally lost. And my professor, who was the best one in my school, and he was from, he's from Israel, Alex Mella. Hi, Alex. But even Alex was caught, it was a victim of circumstances of time of zeitgeist and always asked us, what is the form determining factor? Here, performance, bioclimatic performance was the form determinant factor. And how cool is that 
literally and figuratively speaking, that also speaks for the parking plinth, because that one reminded us of a little detail uh, on the ground in between the two towers that, that you, Ron, spotted. Please elaborate on that one. Yeah, right at the base of the Twin Towers, there's a, a very interesting, potentially exciting space, four-story glass box resting on a podium, which is the ground floor. But it's all glass. Uh, I, I believe that it must be uh, the public spaces that the uh, owners of those condominiums would share uh, because of, it, of its very prime location. So. Very exciting to see that glass box in New York or Chicago or Spokane, but it is a glass box four stories high with the sun blaring into it each and every day. Yeah, and as we like to say, your term is refrigerator because it only works if it would be refrigerated, but we see greenery in there, which we're happy to see. And in yesterday's show with Jay and Scott Wilson, uh, they were promoting greenery to bring in the buildings, but not in such a way. This is like the, you know, the, the opposite of what a greenhouse you know, would, would want to be. Uh, because if you turn that AC off, they all turn brown, all these plants immediately, right? They die. So quite ironic again, uh, well-intentioned, well-meant community space, but just like done in, in an invasive way. So uh, let's leave these towers to come soon and move on to the next one. Next slide, please which actually happens to be the first one that popped up in that area. And uh, speaking of Jay being very active, he had been featuring that in a show with my colleague, Professor Hyun Jong Park, that you see show quoted at the very top right. And this tower in particular prides itself to be affordable. They say condos starting in the high 200Ks, which is not much different than what you, Ron, just said about the cost of that studio in that previous run, right? So the question is, how affordable is this really? And so um, besides it being a box, but even a box, and let's go to the next slide, you could make a box attractive in a tropical exotic uh, way as tropical brutalism has done as using the local aggregates and ingredients of concrete and celebrating and leaving these exposed as we like to call it volcrete or you de Soto and I at the very top left uh, stretching that uh, are more preferred um, material for guardrails, which is that stainless steel metal mesh. So even a box you could have done. And we had this discussion before the show and let's segue to the next slide for that already as you sort of raised and maybe you wanna reiterate that question that you asked us, please. Well, in comparison to the older buildings, which we pay attention to a lot on this program, what we see now is a uniformity of exterior structures and Ron very cleverly and honestly describes these as looking like graph paper because they're just a bunch of little squares and rectangles. I'm wondering if this uniformity is due to developers and designers simply going with standard sizes of glass, panes of glass or other types of building materials so that they don't need to spend more money to create or fabricate anything different. And we're going to see just a short time how some buildings do have specifically fabricated uh, railings, for example. Does that cost more money? And if so, is that why we don't see it as much? Yeah, and we were saying, Ron, and you and I coming from practice, um, sorry, um, to, to paint concrete is an extra effort, right? Extra labor. And, you know, different than you guys, I remember when uh, we were visiting um, Harbor Square for doing a show about it, I asked you if you had asked your boss and friend at Killingsworth ever why he preferred to paint concrete white. And if I remember, remember correctly, you said you have not, but you think you know the answer because it was about dematerializing things because your members were so filigree. So by using the color white, it would reflect you know, it off, it would bounce off. 
But here, everything is detailed in a really clumsy way. So it's almost like enhancing, you know, the, the boxiness, the bulkiness. And again, in all honesty, uh, glass guardrails are more expensive than steel, uh, you know, guardrails, uh, single bar, steel bar guardrails. And glass is, after all, uh, one of the most expensive materials. So we don't think, um, again, cost is, is, is the reason. And we will get to maybe one of the explanations in a little bit. This is, in, in, in fairness, is the northern elevation that's fronting Kapiolani Boulevard. So that's where uh, north is facing Mauka. Uh, so this elevation, at least from a bioclimatic point of view, isn't quite as bad, although we were looking at these uh, awning uh, elements that you could pop open in your all flush uh, glazed facade. And uh, we were saying that probably the square footage uh, of few inches would not be enough to uh, sufficiently flush a space with, uh, with uh, the trade wind cooling as the good old jealousies have been doing very efficiently and effectively. So now let's look at how this building here meets the ground. That's something that Scott uh, and Jay were talking about yesterday being very important. So next slide, and you guys give me, show me your enthusiasm about the entrance of the building. Well, I don't think we have a lot of enthusiasm for the entrance of this building. Uh, in our pre-show discussion, we were talking about how this little sort of uh, porte cochere, if not even a porte cochere, has these very heavy elements of the two rounded columns as well as the thickness of the canopy. But at the same time, the size is so insignificant that it really doesn't do anything, it doesn't perform anything, and it doesn't really look very interesting. Above the facades of these uh, retail spaces, there's this kind of latticework element that's sticking out but it really doesn't do anything. It doesn't provide any shelter from rain. And because the direct sun is not visible on this side of the building, it doesn't provide any significant shade. Um, and in this concrete expanse in the front, there are these prefab uh, chair table units, which are completely uninviting because they have no covering over them as well. So that's not something that you probably want to go to, you're probably not want to going to sit there and enjoy food that you've just purchased inside at these retail stores or restaurants yeah. or whatever they are. And these retail store here, you know, it's following the buzzword of mixed use. So yes, there is no parking, but there is a shop down there and it seems like a cafe or something. But there are kind of stickers on the glass. We're open, almost ironic because it's all fixed glaze. So, and the door is closed. So how open are they, right? <laughs> really kind of disappointing. So how would, uh, you know, in environments like that, how can they look tropical, exotic, inviting, appealing, attractive? And that gets us to the next slide and you guys share your thoughts. Ron, you wanna, you wanna talk about why this is appealing? Well, that, that's a, a site that I haven't seen except in, uh, in the slide that's on the screen now. And uh, I might just have to, to leave those comments to uh, DeSoto because I need time to think about that one. Okay. Well, what we see here are, again, um, details on the lanais that are, make, this whole un, make them unusual or stand out. And particularly because this is a hotel and you're, if you're staying in a hotel, you're on vacation and you're in a more playful mood. First of all, they've chosen a paint piece, cement slabs pink, but also the, the uh, panels that stick out between the lanais on the same floor are detailed to have a little scalloped edge to them that mimics the scalloped edge of the metal railings of the lanais themselves. So there's a theme that goes together there. And again, particularly for a hotel, this playfulness or this quirkiness is, is something that people can appreciate for the, the use that the building is put to. But also on this same slide, we see this wonderful picture looking up or looking along the street in the distance. And there's this very vivid piece of a rainbow there towards the Ko'olau Mountains looking from Waikiki. And as uh, Martin said, this is something that is, while there are rainbows all over the planet, 
the ones here are particularly prominent and we are proud of them and show them off and we've even put them on our license plates because they're so common or we're so proud of them here. So this again is something that is part of our natural environment that we hope living arrangements will take advantage of rather than try to seal out. Yeah, this is grantedly not on our, which we're investigating in these shows on Capulani Boulevard, but this is a boulevard type street as well, which is Cohio Avenue, which is where we looked into the uh, Lilia new rental apartment high rise in the previous shows. And you see our sibling um, SL Benz Cruiser with a top down, where else in the world can you drive with a convertible top down other than in Hawaii. And again, as you said already, where else are the rainbows so saturated? And where else is architecture so kooky, tropical, exotic, potentially, right? Other than in Hawaii. And that is our criticism of the appearance of uh, these buildings. They're so bland. They look so universal in not a good way. This is not international style of the modernist people who thought, you know, lean and clean glass boxes, you know, are the next thing. And they were at that time, but we've been moved on ever since. And especially in Hawaii, that Lever House SOM as the sort of, you know, artifact of that typology doesn't work. And all the clever mid-century modern masters have done their very best to morph and transform that, that modern model. Okie dokie. So what that has to do with the current building we're observing, we have to leave up to next week because we're already at the end of another exciting 28 minutes. So uh, see you all back for that one. And, and then until then, please all stay very inclusively exotic, exotically inclusive and safe and peaceful, of course, first and foremost. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.